Welcome to Learning English. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel, Jill Robbins, Faith Perlow, and Dan Novak. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Friedel. Ukraine says Russia sent thousands of new soldiers into its eastern Donbass region on Tuesday. Regional leaders say they are trying to evacuate civilians and hold on to key cities. In a video speech Monday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said Russia has been preparing to take over the region for a long time. Zelensky continued, saying a large part of the Russian army is centering its efforts on an attack in the region. The Donbass includes two provinces, Luhansk and Donetsk along with the coastal city of Mariupol. If Russia takes over control of the region, it will connect Russia with the Crimean Peninsula, an area it took in 2014. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, confirmed another stage of this operation is beginning. Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu said Russia's plan is to liberate the provinces in the border area. In Mariupol, Russian soldiers told the last Ukrainian fighters remaining in the area to give up their fight or be killed. Zelensky, however, said his nation's soldiers will keep fighting. We will defend ourselves, he said. In addition to the fighting in the east, Ukrainian regional governor Maxim Kozitsky said three missiles hit military targets in the western city of Lviv. Another missile, he said, hit a car repair shop. Lviv is only 60 kilometers from Poland and has not been hit as hard as other parts of Ukraine in the war which started in late February. Lviv is an important target, as it is one of Ukraine's main transportation centers. Western nations are sending aid into Ukraine through the city. I'm Dan Friedel. China says it has officially signed a security agreement with the Solomon Islands. The deal has raised concerns among observers in Australia, the United States, and other countries. They are concerned about China's growing influence in the South Pacific Ocean area. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wenbin spoke to reporters about the agreement Thursday in Beijing. He said the agreement was recently signed by Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Solomon Islands Foreign Minister Jeremiah Manele. Australian Broadcasting Corporation reported that Wang said the purpose of the agreement is to promote social stability and long-term peace and security in the Solomon Islands. He said it would not target any third party. An early version or draft of the agreement appeared on social media in late March. At the time, the Solomon Islands confirmed it was negotiating a deal with the Chinese government in Beijing. The draft included a provision that could permit China to send armed police and soldiers to the Solomon Islands. It would also let China base its Navy ships off the coast of the islands. The draft agreement led to concerns in Australia and the U.S. that China would establish a military base in the Solomon Islands. 
the island group is less than 2,000 kilometers from Australia. Zed Seselja is Australia's Minister for the Pacific. He traveled to the Solomon Islands capital, Honiara, to ask Prime Minister Manasa Sogavare not to sign the agreement. Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang dismissed the concerns about the security deal in his announcement Tuesday. He accused the U.S. and Australia of deliberately increasing tension. Prime Minister Sogavare has said the agreement will not include the establishment of a Chinese military base. I'm Jill Robbins. Rising food prices, border closures, and the war in Ukraine have caused many Muslim families in Senegal to feel the pressure of inflation during the special month of Ramadan. Astu Mandiang is 64 years old, and she sells porridge by the road. When she and her family met for their first meal of the day, after the sun went down, there was no meat on the table. At the market, there is a lack of food, said Mandiang, while she fixed dinner in her kitchen without electricity. Food prices in West Africa have increased 20 to 30 percent since 2017 because of the lack of farm workers, dry conditions, and various conflicts. The pandemic has hurt supply chains because of borders closing. And recently, the war in Ukraine caused even more pressure on Muslim families. They cannot replace food supplies for visiting family, neighbors, or people in need. Prices have soared, and we return home without knowing what to cook. When they give us change, we think they made a mistake. They tell us the price has risen, and there is nothing we can do, Mandiang said. Mandiang only has enough money to buy fish because it is less costly than meat. Fish is available because Senegal is by the ocean. She is thankful that she bought enough onions before the price increased during Ramadan. Most traditional food in Senegal, like onions and rice, are bought from other countries. Rice is 10% more costly, and cooking oil has risen 50% more. Mamadou Diop is a representative from a charity, Action Against Hunger, in Senegal. He said that the charity depends on outside resources for help in feeding people. Diop also said that the price of beef has increased in Senegal. This is because Mali, a neighboring country, cannot sell their meat to other countries because of economic punishments for having had a military overthrow. I'm Faith Perlo. The Bangladesh government closed the last private school for Rohingya refugees last month. The Kayapuri school in the Kutsupalong Rohingya refugee camp was founded in 2019 by a Rohingya leader who was killed last year. The school was the latest of about 30 such schools closed by the police. Some closed on their own because the police were going to shut them down. With the March 24th shutdown of the school in southern Bangladesh, no schools remain in operation. Mohammed Showife was the head of the school. He was working in his office when police raided the building. 
He told VOA the police took his computer and printer. The next day, police took seats from classrooms and locked the school door. Police asked whether we had any official permission for the school, he said. We didn't have any in a written format. Our leader got verbal permission from an official appointed by the government to open the school. Now, all of a sudden, the Bangladesh government decides to close it down. Many of the schools were made of wood with cloth roofs. There were few classroom materials inside, but they were very important to the thousands of Rohingya children with very limited ability to go to school in the camps. The government did not give legal status to the refugee led schools, but the government agreed in 2020 to permit them to operate and promised aid if needed. Bangladesh's Office of the Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner provides humanitarian assistance for Rohingya refugees. It said on December 13th that all private schools in the Rohingya camps must be shut down. They were illegal because they did not have official permission to operate. After the order, police began raiding the schools and seizing school materials, including seats and computers, sources told VOA. The organization Human Rights Watch said Bangladesh officials threatened to seize Rohingya refugees' identification documents. They also threatened to forcibly relocate them to a distant island if they violated the ban on the schools. Bill Van Esfeld is with Human Rights Watch. He said, First the government blocked meaningful education for Rohingya children, then it closed the schools Rohingya set up for themselves, and now it threatens to banish teachers and students to a prison-like island. Shawif, the head of the school, said he had been fearing a raid after two other private schools were also closed down by police. Eighth grader Rabia Akhtar, 15, said the closure had ruined her dream of becoming an engineer. After we fled Myanmar in 2017, we were idle for a year and a half, but this school gave us a chance to resume our education, she said. I am worried because my family might want to marry me off. I don't want to get married so early. Ayatullah is in ninth grade. He said, I was dreaming of becoming a doctor. Now it's all gone. There are no ways for us to get further education. Officials are defending their actions, saying they have only stopped the operations of illegal establishments. In an interview with VOA, Additional Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner Mohammed Shamsud Duza said, Would you allow an illegal establishment to operate in your premises for long? I guess not. Duza said the Kayapuri school did not have permission to operate. He said that some of its teachers were teaching the official Bangla language, which the government bars. It does not want Rohingyas to integrate into Bangladesh and permanently remain in the country. Duza said the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, or UNICEF, is leading the effort to teach Rohingya children. The UNICEF office in Bangladesh told VOA that over 350,000 Rohingya refugee children are attending 3,200 learning centers in the Cox's Bazaar Rohingya refugee camps. UNICEF supports 2,800 of the centers. Abdur Rahim is the leader of the Arakan Rohingya Society for Peace and Human Rights, a Rohingya support group. He told VOA the learning centers teach children up to age 14, but the teaching does not go past second grade. That's why we had started those private schools inside the camps, 
so that our children could get secondary-level education, Rahim said. He added that thousands of children between 14 and 18 years old are now left without a place to learn. I'm Dan Novak. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We tell the story of the 38th President of the United States. Mr. Chief Justice, my dear friends, my fellow Americans, the oath that I have taken is the same oath that was taken by George Washington and by every president under the Constitution. But I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances never before experienced by Americans. Gerald Ford was sworn into office on August 9, 1974. Ford was vice president to Richard Nixon, who had announced the day before that he would resign. If Nixon had not resigned, he might have been removed from office. Congress had been moving to charge him with corruption in the Watergate case. At his swearing-in ceremony, the new president spoke about the nation's future. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. He went on to say, As we bind up the internal wounds of Watergate, more painful and more poisonous than those of foreign wars, let us restore the golden rule to our political process and let brotherly love purge our hearts of suspicion and of hate. Gerald Ford became the only leader in American history to have served both as vice president and president without being elected. Richard Nixon chose him as vice president in October 1973. That was when Nixon's former vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned because of criminal charges that he failed to pay his taxes. When Nixon himself resigned, Ford became president. Ford was a longtime congressman from the state of Michigan. He was well liked by his congressional colleagues. His education was in economics and political science at the University of Michigan. Then he attended Yale Law School. During World War II, he served as a naval officer in the Pacific. After the war, Ford entered politics. He was a member of the Republican Party. He was first elected to the House of Representatives in 1948. He won re-election 12 times. Republicans in the House elected him the minority leader during the administration of Democratic President Lyndon Johnson. Ford was still minority leader when Richard Nixon, a fellow Republican, was elected president in 1968. In his leadership position, Ford helped win approval of a number of Nixon's proposals. He became known for his strong loyalty to the president. It was no surprise then when Nixon named Ford as vice president. Gerald Ford was an accidental president. He came to office in a sudden turn of events. Almost as suddenly, he had to decide what to do about the former president. After Nixon left office, he could have been charged with crimes for his part in covering up the events of Watergate. Instead, one month after Nixon resigned, President Ford settled the question. 
he pardoned Nixon for any crimes that he might have committed. The pardoning of Nixon made many Americans angry. Some believed he should have been put on trial. They thought he might have answered more questions about Watergate if he had not been pardoned. Ford said he pardoned Nixon in an effort to unite the country. For a while, though, the pardon only seemed to intensify the divisions. And I wondered whether anybody had brought to your attention the fact that the Constitution specifically states that even though somebody is impeached, that person shall nonetheless be liable to punishment according to law. In October 1974, President Ford appeared before a congressional hearing on the pardon. He gave a strong response to questioning by Democratic Representative Elizabeth Holtzman. Uh, Mrs. Holtzman, I was fully cognizant of uh, the fact that the president, uh, on resignation, uh, was accountable uh, for any criminal charges. Uh, but I would like to say that the reason I gave the pardon was not as to Mr. Nixon himself. I repeat, and I repeat with emphasis, the purpose of the pardon was to try and get the United States, the Congress, the president and the American people focusing on the serious problems we have both at home and abroad. And I was absolutely convinced then, as I am now, that if we had had this series, an indictment, a trial, a conviction, and anything else that transpired after that, that the attention of the president, the Congress, and the American people would have been diverted from the problems that we have to solve. And that was the principal reason for my granting of the pardon. Anger about the pardon was still strong when President Ford made another controversial decision. He pardoned men who had illegally avoided military service in the Vietnam War. Most of them were not sent to prison. Instead, they were offered a chance to do work for their communities. Many of the men, however, did not accept the president's offer. Some stayed in Canada or other countries where they had fled to avoid the draft. President Ford received greater public support when he asked Congress to limit the activities of the nation's intelligence agencies. He hoped better control would prevent future administrations from abusing the constitutional rights of Americans, as Nixon had done. On another issue, Ford, while serving as vice president, had described inflation as America's public enemy number one. He had supported several measures to fight it. As president, however, an economic recession forced him to cancel some of those measures. Inflation decreased during the recession, but unemployment increased. On foreign policy issues, Ford kept Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State. Kissinger had won much praise for his service to Richard Nixon including in the opening of diplomatic ties with communist China. But Kissinger had also received much criticism. Critics accused him of interfering with civil liberties in the name of national security. They also accused him of supporting the overthrow of the Marxist government of Salvador Allende in Chile. By the time Ford became president, the United States and the Soviet Union had taken steps to try to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. Nixon and Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev had signed two such agreements as part of the detente policy to ease Cold War tensions. 
relations with China were also less tense than before. American policy in Southeast Asia, however, had failed. Involvement in the Vietnam War had officially ended the year before Gerald Ford became president. But fighting continued between South Vietnam and communist forces from the North. The peace agreement signed by the United States and North Vietnam in 1973 left South Vietnam to defend itself. By 1975, South Vietnamese forces were clearly in danger of defeat. President Ford tried to prevent a communist takeover. He asked Congress to approve $700 million in military aid for South Vietnam. Congress said no. The American people were tired of paying for the war. Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital, fell to communist forces on April 30th, 1975. President Ford ordered the rescue of American citizens and South Vietnamese who had supported the American efforts. Few people who saw those struggling to escape Saigon will ever forget that day. Terrified Vietnamese were screaming for help at the American embassy. Everyone was pushing, trying to escape the city. Some held on to overloaded military helicopters as the aircraft tried to take off. As a signal to American citizens to prepare to leave, Armed Forces Radio had played the song White Christmas. Some were to go to an apartment building where a helicopter would pick them up from the roof. But other people also tried to get onto the helicopter, a scene captured in a famous news photo of the fall of Saigon. The former South Vietnamese capital was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. In the Middle East, Henry Kissinger led negotiations after the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. Israel agreed to give up some captured territory. In return, the United States promised not to recognize or deal with the Palestine Liberation Organization unless the PLO met certain conditions. In September 1975, Israel and Egypt signed an agreement that included permission for American civilians to act as observers along the ceasefire lines. Henry Kissinger was praised for his peacemaking efforts, though peace in the Middle East would remain a challenge for future administrations. At home, things seemed better as the presidential election campaign of 1976 began. That year marked the nation's 200th birthday. The United States was not fighting any wars. Unemployment remained high, but inflation had eased. Most importantly, Gerald Ford had led the country through the difficult period after Watergate. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.